All righty, folks, we are going to do something we've never done on this channel. And never done is pretty hard to do when you've done 12,000 plus videos. But we are going to talk about how to lose the most money, the fastest in real estate. And we're going to have this conversation with the one and only CEO of Hemlane, Dana Dunford. How are you doing, Dana? I'm great. Thanks for having me back on this morning. Yeah, this is not a topic I have ever discussed before. Uh, you know, generally speaking, real estate has been very good to me. Uh, it's uh, It does a lot of good things for lots of people. But yeah, over 20 years, Dana, I have seen people lose a lot of money very, very quickly, uh, as I know you have. So why don't we just put it on the table and kind of remind people how not to do that? Because there are some things that certainly should be avoided. Yeah, and that's it's such a great point. And I want to start with talking about not sweating the small stuff. Okay. And what I mean by that with small stuff is it's very, very easy at night to work yourself up because you could have made another $25 a month on, on the rent or a vendor overcharged you by $30 or, or something like that. And really, in the grand scheme of things, that's not going to matter. It's consistent results and making sure that you're on top of everything to learn from what's happened in the past to prevent um, any mistakes and, and risks in the future. Um, however, I've seen a couple of situations, um, both personal as, as well as through my network, where you lose it all really quickly. And... It's interesting because, Michael, you probably have experienced this too in real estate. It somehow attracts a lot of fraudulent people. <laughs> yes. Yes. And the quick, I actually, the quick money types. Yes. Yes. And I actually have not quite found a, another industry that has so much of a parallel of mm -hmm. people who are what I consider bad actors in this space. Um, and it's one of those things where I've always learned to be like, well, so what's your credit score uh, type <laughs> thing, just <Yeah>. to like, <laughs> to, to make sure that, um, you're working with uh, good actors. So the first one I want to start with is the purchase of the property. Mm. And the, the reason for that is I've even had a situation where given money to a developer and the property never got developed and it hurts. It hurts a lot because one that money could have been invested somewhere else and you could have had a return on it. Um, two, you're having to now deal with arbitration and um, lawyers and all sorts of things that are just, it's not worth your time to, to do and um, your energy. And then um, three, it prevents you from focusing on the future and getting your next property and investing in real estate. And so that very first relationship of that diligence, um, I think what I've personally learned is if something seems too easy or quick to do a deal, you almost want to slow down to speed up. And mm -hmm. I know you talk about that of do the work, continuously do the work. I think it's really important on the relationship side as well, that almost if if something looks really good and it's like, wow, that's great. I can cash flow this right away. Look at what the rates are and the, the value of the property. Kind of think about what is everything that could go wrong in this situation? And I think writing it out on paper and writing it out even on Excel, like if you look at your model and your variables and you're saying, which of these could change, you learn so much from those mistakes and you also hope it never happens to someone else. So mm -hmm. I think my first one is during the acquisition and the purchase of the property. No, you're absolutely right. So I've been, do I've been through several cycles in real estate, 23 years, an active buyer. And I've seen several can't miss strategies that always feel good, probably are profitable for a minute. Then the bad actors come, they add gasoline, they pull in all their friends and families and pretty much, the money's lit on fire. That happened back in the 08 crash. Uh, it happens with, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot of LPs get smoked in this multi, in this syndication pain that's coming and it's starting to unravel already. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're absolutely right. The first thing I wrote down is buying wrong, right? If you, anybody, I hope people hear me. Anybody can buy real estate, but not many people can buy a great deal. And that's because most yeah. of us don't like to do the work. We don't like to, you know, dig in. We don't like to 
we don't like to learn average first and then go do a great deal. It, you know, we, I, I can't tell you how many people have told me, Dana, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I've looked for 30 days. I'm just going to buy something. I'm going to consider it. I'm, I know I'm going to lose money, but it's going to be my education. What are you doing? Right. That's, that's not okay. Go make 5% in a money market account or something. Um, yeah. Buying, buying wrong is definitely the worst one. I'll, I'll flip it. Let's assume you do buy it, but you don't have enough reserves, right? Uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is never touching your reserves. I don't care if the best deal ever comes across your plate. If the only money you have is reserves, you don't have it. Go find a partner, pass it to a friend. I don't care. But as soon as you don't have reserves, Murphy's Law kicks in and three things are going to break. The last thing you want to become once you're an owner is a forced seller. If you are a forced seller, you are out of options. And there will be sharks out there that try to get their pound of flesh. And um, yeah, there's, I see lots of people running with really skinny reserves. And, you know, I've seen crazy things happen, you know, uh, water, multiple water heaters and roof mount, you know, AC heater combination, uh, sewer pipes get cracked from the 50 year old trees. I mean, I, I've seen crazy stuff, you know, seemingly happen in, in threes. Uh, so please don't ever become a forced seller because you don't have reserves. So that's the first one I'll bring out. Yeah, I, I love that one. It's it's so true. And also just your point on alligator properties and stuff like that, being very, very mindful. Um, my My second one is on tenants. So very similar of, you know, in instinct, it's interesting, I, I go with instinct, and sometimes people delight me and correct me and surprise me when I'm wrong, after working and building up that trust with them. But I've had situations where I've said, wow, you know, I'm just desperate to place a, a tenant into this property. It's, mm -hmm. you know, something to do with COVID or something where it was just more challenging. And it's like, okay, they're not perfect. They have to have someone else co-sign for them. But then suddenly you see other red flags, like, okay, they want to move in tomorrow. <laughs> um, they're really, they're, 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 they're really pushy about this. And, you know, the hardest thing to do with anything is to quit. It's almost easier to keep going through the pain or the questioning and hope it gets better. And a lot of times I found you just have to stop in your place and say, you know what, I need to change things right now. And maybe I was wrong. Maybe this person is going to be a good actor, but I have enough red flags now that I probably should turn back around, even if I've lost money now without the hopes that it will get better. Mm -hmm. And I continue to learn that. And I sometimes I almost feel like you have to learn it the hard way, but it's a reminder that if you're feeling that with any type of situation, whether it's a contractor you're working with, a tenant you're working with, an agent you're working with, if anything seems a bit fishy and not honest, you need to take a step back from the situation and say, how do I just mitigate this risk altogether? And I think that's the that's another one where then you get the tenant in the property, there's evictions, there's this and that, it goes on and the pain just continues and it gets worse. Mm -hmm. And so taking a real step back is is very important. Yeah, I love that one. Um, I just actually, something I'm doing on my channel now is doing a new investor series. And unfortunately, one of the one of the stories we, we did was a gentleman lost over 50 grand to an unscrupulous property manager. And if we were kind of break this down, it's it's when you trust but don't verify, right? If you happen to have property management like I've had since day one, and you aren't yeah. on top of that, setting expectations, asking for pictures, receipts, multiple bids, all of those things, there's a very good chance that at some point you're going to be taken advantage of. Now, this case happens to be all out fraud and, and hopefully, you know, the person goes to jail, uh, but you've got to verify. Money is involved. Yeah. Nobody cares about your money more than you. So set expectations, track, um, you know, have the rules of the road, right? Anything over or below 250 is this or that. Just you've got to verify. And it's it's funny when when in that episode, right at the end, I'm like, this is why Hemlane exists. 
right? Because when I started doing this, everything was freaking fax machine. We were faxing invoices back and forth. It was yep. how crazy it was. But now if you did have him link, because now he's pulled over self-management, you could see it all. You can you can verify, you can tie the bids to the receipts. Just it's applications like him link. Um, really make it easier for that self-manager, which he's now taking over self-management to do a lot more um, and, and, you know, de-risk the situation. So yeah, you got to verify folks, you're getting bids, you're getting work. You're, it's just, yeah, trust, trust, but verify, please. Yep, absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned that because in today's day and age, I wonder why more property managers don't do the following, which I see the best property managers do. They actually send the rent directly to the owner Yeah, right away in day three or four. They're not holding it for 15 days and they're saying, hey, it goes directly to their bank account. Like we don't even hold it in a trust account. We just have a reserve on repairs, which quite honestly, unless you're doing a large project, you know, the average repair that we see in our system is if it's just a service call, it's going to be under 100 if it's um, the actual repair itself, the what we see on average is $185. It's not that much. Mm. And it's not like you would have multiple of those. And so from a reserve perspective, it's like, well, why do they have to hold so much in rent? And so I do, I hear that so often that it's, hey, I finally found out the tenant was paying rent, but the property manager was holding on to it. And it, it is one of those things you don't want to, one commingle funds, you also want to have control of um, your money. And so uh, I'm sorry to hear that about him. It's a, it's a good thing um, that he's self-managing now. Yeah, he, he was very upfront. He took he took the L, he owned it, and he, it's going to be better. And he wanted to share the story because he wanted others to avoid the red flag. So, uh, you know, there is a, a silver lining at the end of it. And uh, I thanked him for coming on. So what's, Dana, let's do one more each. What's, what's your last one? Yeah, my last one is on um, a really good way to lose money is on vacancy. Ah. And so that is one where I see because that's that is where your property becomes an alligator, you're paying a mortgage every month, and no money is coming into it. And there's always to some extent, some sort of excuse that I see of why, oh, well, you know, it's seasonality, and I'll wait two months or this or that. And um, you can't predict the future. Um, I mean, you can make assumptions and uh, have a hypothesis of what's going to happen. But I think the, the biggest thing is to say, how do I control it now and get a qualified tenant? And then how do I set up the lease structure so that maybe, you know, once it is higher season, there's a rent increase. And so really just focusing on looking at your asset to say, how do I keep it with that 100% occupancy? Mm -hmm. is really, really important because the moment that you don't is the moment you start paying a mortgage without having any rental income come in. Yeah, it's funny. I had that one too. I called it, don't, you know, don't, uh, you don't take the small loss, right? Lowering it 25 or 50 bucks because you've got a vacancy in the winter to fill it up. It's okay, right? At, do an 18 month lease or whatever it is so that next time uh, it, it's in the spring or summer season. That's a good one. I'll actually do one different not inspecting the property, right? You know, I've been buying for so long. I bought through the foreclosure wave, um, you know, still buying today. Uh, a couple of fun stories. So one of the things uh, that was very common, obviously, in the 08 crash was to buy foreclosures, right? Buying at the courthouse steps. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting experience. A lot of sharks, a lot of crazy stuff goes on there. But I remember one guy, at the, at the courthouse, uh, we started bidding on a property. And it happened to be one that, that I had looked at in the past. And it essentially was burned. That The back half of the house was burned. It looked great from the street, right? If you did a drive-by appraisal and you didn't get out of the car, you would not have known that half the house was essentially gone. Um, and in this instance, this individual did the drive-by appraisal, didn't get out of the car because there was a lot, right? right and pure, just didn't do it. And uh, it was really sad to see that the, the community around him at the because they wanted him to spend all his money. So they ran him up. He paid more than he should have by a lot. 
and he got a halfway burned house and he was, wow. he never came back. And, you know, sewer, I mean, and it gets in more interesting, right? Sewer pipes are all this or your mechanicals and you got to inspect the house. I remember there was a house um, that had a crawl space in Fresno and it, it, it basically was being held up in one corner by like a rock. <laughs> you know, oh my the, gosh the footer had had washed out i was like really they got a rock that's holding up the corner of the house um you know so inspect your houses especially you know just always inspect your houses understand that the inspection report is going to be there and scare you right because they're always really long and have lots of stuff look for the big things um you, you yeah be surprised. so there's a lot of ways to lose a lot of money very quickly in real estate please do the work please do the work uh, but hey, if you want to get an online property management system that's helping hundreds of thousands of people, Dana, where can they go? You can go to www.hemlane.com and mention Michael Zuber or One Rental at a Time for 20% off your first year. Folks, if you're new to the channel, do yourself a favor. Go get the 14-day trial. Just practice being a landlord. You've got nothing to lose. Get the trial, practice, get your buddies involved. Have a good time. Thanks, Dana.